a music MC my supremacy records oh nine yeah yeah, girl in the hood, I'm about to build it up. The girls in the hood, yeah, I'm about to build it up. The girl in the hood, uh huh, I'm about to build it up. Yeah, yeah. We about to build it up, our music. Uh-huh. Come on, we about to build it up. Don't see. That's right. Yeah, we about to build it up, my supremacy. President Bush saluted us. And President Bush said, my father was a, a pilot in World War II, and there was no problem with him being saluted or, or uh, having salutes returned. But I know that black men experienced many instances where they were not saluted and salutes were not returned, so President Bush saluted us. And, uh, Welcome to this episode of Pleasant Perspectives. As you know, I'm your host, Michael W. Pleasant, and we're joined today by a very special guest. We're actually honored to have him in studio, Dr. Richardson. He is one of the members of the Tuskegee Airmen, and he gave us time today to talk about some of his experiences, uh, what he's up to today, and what examples and lessons we can learn from some uh, courageous and proud men that did some wonderful things over 60, 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. Dr. Richardson, welcome to the program. Pleasure, it's a pleasure. How are you feeling? I'm feeling quite well, thank you. Feeling quite well? Oh, oh yes. That's uh -huh. good, man. It's, uh, it's hard to believe it's March. Hey, yeah, it's warm today. I think we're going to have an extremely hot summer. Yeah, yeah, I want to wait first. Building up now. Yeah, yeah I tell you, I want to first start off by saying thank you, obviously, for coming into the mm -hmm. studio, but then all of the hard work that you and your fellow airmen did and the example yeah, and the legacy. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for all of that. Yeah, you're, you're quite loved. I was very proud to be a part of it. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the legacy, you guys accomplished so much in the face of such blatant racism and so much yes. uh, bigotry. Mm -hmm. What gave you the strength to continue pushing and continue fighting? Was it just plain old integration or you wanted to prove that you were just as good as the white powers? Well, I think we had, uh, well, you know, there was a double V campaign, the Pittsburgh Curve the Philadelphia Tribune and other papers had a double V campaign. Of course, we had our own double V. Okay. We wanted to be successful in flight school. Okay. And double V, please tell us what well, double V is. Victory at home over racism and victory abroad uh -huh. against the uh, against our enemies, okay. the Axis. Okay. Well, our my own personal V was to become a pilot. Uh -huh. I wanted to fly since I was a six-year-old kid. Okay. I wanted okay. to fly an airplane. Yeah. And uh, all through my years, I dreamed about flying, we read books about flying, you know, made airplanes, model airplanes, and pretended to be flying, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was really, really great for me okay. to uh, get to be a pilot. You know, the elimination rate was 66%. Hmm. So uh, just about every day, somebody came back home crying. Some guy came back crying because okay. he, was, he was being eliminated. Was that, and that elimination wasn't all due to racism. That was, no, that maybe was not just uh, not being able to pass all the uh, jump all the hurdles. Okay, jump okay. through all the loops. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, once you finally did jump through all the hoops and you were certified a pilot, mm -hmm. you were then told even further, "No, you can't. No, you won't." Well, yes, they, it's a, it's amazing. We were in war since December of uh, '41. And during the summer of 42, the guys were training, ready to go into combat. No commanders in Europe or Japan would take a black squadron. Wow, okay. Can you imagine? We've been at war for nine months. Okay. But they wouldn't take black guys to fight in the air. They wanted us to dig ditches and, uh, you know, do, do that kind of thing. How did you prove your worth? How did you prove that we can and we do deserve to be in those areas? We finally did get into combat. It took quite a bit. It took eight months of, of political agitation for us to even get a, our guys to get an assignment to go into combat. And when they finally did go into combat, uh, they had a racist commander over in Europe that uh, gave them a hard time mm -hmm. and uh, poor assignments, poor evaluations. He even wanted the uh, army to send, send our guys back home even if they got over there. Okay. And um, with their lousy assignments, they weren't getting any aerial combat victories. Mm -hmm. He wanted to send them back home. Eisenhower uh, reviewed all the records and said, no, these guys are just as good as they stay. Yeah. And, um, our guys shot down an airplane. They didn't get over there until like May of 43. Okay. okay. And finally in July of 43, one of our guys shot down a German aircraft. Yeah. But there were no more 
aerial combat victories for like six months. Okay. okay. And during that time, there was talk about sending them back home. Mm -hmm. But then our guys um, were transferred to another group, and they uh, took part in the invasion of Anzio. They, they were flying over protecting the fleet while the Allies were invading the port of Anzio in Italy. A couple of minutes ago, you spoke of poor assignments, uh, poor technology, poor planes, and then you get this uh, Anzio assignment. Mm -hmm. Did you have better planes, better well, technology? Well, the same the planes, just strictly the commander of the group. Okay. The, the 33rd group commander was a racist guy, a guy named Momar, Colonel Momar, a racist guy. He uh, gave, the, gave the 99th Squadron, you know, lousy assignments and so forth. But then they, they transferred our guys to the 79th group. And Colonel Bates, who commanded that group, uh, was a you know, regular guy. He put our guys in with the other guys and gave them regular assignments. And that's when they had the assignment over Anzio. Mm. Uh, the group was patrolling over Anzio. But our the 99th Squadron had a particular segment to uh, you know to cover. Sure. And in, in like a week's time, our guy shot down uh, 17 German airplanes. Okay. Okay. And that uh, proved to them that hey, our guys got it going as well as the others. Sure. And then after that, I imagine the assignment started to flood in. Yes. After that, they did. Yes, we know the pilots were uh, black, but also the technicians were black. Yes. Uh, the mechanics were all black. Right. Was there any kind of special training that they received? Yeah, well, the, train, the, uh, the mechanics were trained at, uh, out, in, um, out in Indiana, Idaho, somewhere out west. At an all black school? No, no, it, it, it was a white, an integrated school, it was an all black class. Okay, okay, okay. And that group of guys were being trained to be mechanics. There was this one group of black guys mm. that were always together and not, not, not intermixed. Okay, okay. But they had the same training that the. Uh, that the white guys had, and they were assigned to um, the three. Well, some of them were assigned to the 332nd group that was training in Oscoda, Michigan, uh -huh. and others were assigned to uh, Tuskegee. Okay, okay. And the guys that were assigned to uh, Oscoda, Michigan, they went overseas. When the 332nd went over to combat, yes. that group of guys went over to combat with them. I see. And uh, all the mechanics, all the engineers, all the armorers, the gunners, the flight surgeons, everybody over there was black. Okay. Every skill, every te technical aspect of flying an airplane, black guys. Black guys, mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me this, <laughs> if you uh, were able to speak for all Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. um, you can speak for all Tuskegee Airmen, and you're going to deliver, going to deliver a message to the youth of today, what mm -hmm. would that message be? The message would be, don't let anyone define you. You define yourself. You can do anything that any other human being does. Okay. And these these reports and these crazy things that they're issuing at that, that they're not, you know, in 1925, the United States Army War College, War College, Carl Alberts issued a secret report that every negative that you can think of that you would apply to a human being is in that report being applied to black men. Mm. And that stuff you would totally ignore because we have proven that the highest level of technical skill is possessed in our bodies. Sure. Be behind this color is all the all the technical skill and knowledge that anybody else anybody else could possibly have. And you have it. But you have to believe in yourself and you have to use it. Okay. You have to have right, you have to have the self discipline to make yourself stick to whatever whatever it is that leads whatever course it is that leads you to your to your dream or your objective. You stick to that, believe in yourself, you'll have to you can't miss being a success. How do you overcome? For example, some of us come from broken homes. We come from homes where dad's not there, mom's not there, you know, there may be a bunch of drugs in our community. How can we overcome that to possibly uh, take on and do your message? Well, the scene that you portray is true, and it's very, it's very, very tragic. You know, the single homes and the drugs, and what you have to do, it's gonna be a very tough fight, but you have to steel yourself for that fight. You have to be try your best to, sometimes you might have to be two-faced. You might have to let the guys know, that, hey man, I'm one of you guys, but then you have to also go someplace by yourself and do your thing, do what you know you need to do to make the progress that you wanna make. Mm. Uh, try to do a lot of reading. Uh, single parent, family, kids in those homes are frequently at a disadvantage. Then you have to do extremely well. Yeah, yeah. But then they're, they're frequently at a disadvantage. 
So you have to go out of your way to do extra reading and extra research to try to get the, the knowledge that you need and, and the uh, uh, ego building that you need to make yourself a success in spite of all those negatives. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about the symbol of the Tuskegee Airmen. Obviously, the, the first black uh, air pilot unit mm -hmm. to be so successful. But if you could say we symbolize, we symbolize that, but we mm -hmm. also symbolize this, and we also mean this, what would that be? We well, also mean breaking the chains, breaking the chains that shackled us to a demeaning past. Hmm. It showed us that we, we represent um, progress that, that has been made and can be made. And um, our symbol would be um, an arrow shot straight up. Okay, because okay. That's the, way, that's the way we could go. Oh, yeah. yeah sure. I know in the 90s, uh, President Bush uh, finally recognized uh, you and so many of your fellow airmen for some of your hard work and dedication. Just yes. share with us, what did that feel like? Well, we received the Congressional Gold Medal. Okay. And there were close to 400 of us mm. in the rotunda down at the, the in DC in the White House. And um, President Bush, uh, Colin Powell, Senator Rangel, Senator Levin, um, Nancy Pelosi, a number of dignitaries were there okay. when we received the Congressional Gold Medal. But uh, that, that made me extremely proud. That was most uh, most uplifting, most most inflating. But the um, the inscription on the back of that medal said, "Outstanding combat performance." Okay. Inspired revolutionary reform in the armed forces. Uh -huh. That referred to the fact that in 1948, uh, President Truman issued Executive Order 9981 which started the end to segregation in the military. Okay. And the military was desegregated. Now, Truman saw how well black men were doing over in combat, especially black pilots, you know, that highly skilled work of being a fighter pilot. Yeah. He saw how well they were doing. And uh, there were other blacks, the 761st Tank Unit, the uh, 92nd Division, the Nisis, the Code Talkers. He saw how these people, well, these people of color were performing, and he saw it was just senseless, a waste of time. It was demeaning to have the segregation. So he issued the order, no more segregation in the military. Mm -hmm. And Truman was a real strong guy. Over here, he's the guy that fired General MacArthur. Okay, he, okay. He's a real strong guy. Yeah. And uh, Tuskegee Airmen are the ones who uh, were at the forefront of that. Yeah. And once the military desegregated, then uh, that notion started rolling through our other other ordinary people in, in a, felt that, hey man, desegregation is the way to go because the president did it and he desegregated our army. Okay. So that, that, that's the way to go. And uh, a lot of things started happening around the country. There are a lot of people who were in our corner but were afraid to step out mm. because of pressure from others. Yeah. But with that desegregation in back of them, they were encouraged to step out and uh, do more in terms of equality uh, of the races. Yeah, we know that the movie Red Tails is definitely uh, has helped to keep the uh, spirit and the thought and the, and the pride of yeah, without question of the airmen yeah. relevant. What else is going on to help keep that memory alive and strong? Well, Philadelphia, well, all there there are 50, 55 chapters of Tuskegee Airmen throughout the country. Okay. And all the chapters are involved in, um, you know, educating youth, passing on the legacy, telling uh, our history of Tuskegee Airmen and what that history means okay. for us today and tomorrow. Sure. And sure. all the chapters are involved in that. The national, uh, the national organization gives uh, 25 uh, scholarships. Hmm. Well, I call it book money because it's you know $1,500 books today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that much today, $1,500. But then locally. Locally here in Philadelphia. Well, nationally there's 25, but then locally in Philadelphia, we we also give six, we make six awards. Okay. Over thousand dollars, but then Delaware State University in Dover, Delaware, was one of the first six colleges that had civilian pilot training programs. Mm -hmm. They still have a flying program. Okay. okay. They, they have an airway science department, and we uh, help a student. Like in a senior year, junior senior year, is when they have to get in their flying hours. Okay. okay. And flying is quite expensive. Yeah. So yeah. we uh, we let them select the student that needs the assistance, and we give. Uh, well, last year we gave 
uh, thirty-five hundred dollars. Oh wow! Okay. For a young man to help him with his uh, with the cost of flying. You know, as I said, flying is expensive. So a lot yeah, of kids yeah. uh, can get so far, and in that that money wall, yeah. a, you know. Of course, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, if um, folks wanted to get involved with mm -hmm. uh, the chapter, the local Philadelphia chapter, just from being involved in volunteering or possibly okay. getting some grant money, uh, how would they do that? What do they have to do? Well, they could write to P.O. Box, there's yeah, Tuskegee Airmen, okay. P.O. Box 18966, Philadelphia, PA 19119. And that will get to us, and we can um, respond to any uh, assistance that they wish to uh, okay. wish to offer. We'd be very glad to receive whatever, because there's so many young people out here that need that need help. Sure. And um, those of us who can't eat with a little sacrifice, you know, put out something to help uh, to help these young people, because they have all the skills that anybody else has. They have all the potential anyone else has. They just have to be turned on. To, uh, to, to their and position. the opportunity is there because in your day the opportunity wasn't necessarily there and we still accomplished and you're still accomplished right. well I can have a company titled find your wings okay and it's based on the uh, experience of Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. wherein we help young people learn who they are okay not who their parents say they are not who the uncle said they are yeah. not who some other artificial source said they are but we help them find out what's in their heart and in their gut. Okay. All right. What's in their mind. And does that be a workshop? Do so you conduct workshops? Well, it's, it's something like workshops, but we can do it uh, usually on a group basis. Okay. Uh, you know, in schools and clubs. We even try to draw kids together. Oh, yeah. And uh, we use uh, psychological uh, evaluation instruments and so forth and let them discover just what it is they really are. You know, so many young people. Well, my father was so and so, or my father said this, or my uncle said so and so, or somebody else was doing so and so. Well, let's. What do you want to do? What do you love to do? Okay. Yes. I would like to not have to work. Okay. Yeah. If you know what you love to do, you're not working. <laughs> you get up every morning, whistle, sing, and go off and have fun. Yeah. And then you get paid for it. Sure, sure. It's kind of right. helps them find their passion. Right. Okay. That's okay. what we want kids to be able to do. Huh. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of Rent Hills, the movie is out. George Lucas put up his own money to get the, the, the movie finally made. Ninety-three million dollars. Ninety-three million dollars. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It took him, he said, 22 years. He'd been trying to get other studios to make a movie about that story. Okay. And none of them would take it up. Mm. So finally, he uh, got tired of waiting around, put up his own $93 million. Okay, okay. To make the, uh, make the Red Tail movie. Yeah. You know, starring Terrence Howard, Cuba Gooding, and uh, Nate Parker, and, and, and some others. And I believe it's <laughs> still playing in certain movie theaters. Um, I'm sure it is still playing yeah. in some movie theaters. Uh, it's a darn good portrayal of what happened. Okay, so you think it's uh, really accurate? Well, no, without question. In the beginning, very, very early in the movie, they showed a character named Lightning. Yes. It goes down and shoots up a train engine. And, uh, but our guy shot up 57 train engines. Mm. You know, these trains are carrying supplies up to the front. They're carrying uh, the enemy's war materials. Sure, sure. So um, after, after an escort, our guys did a lot of escorting of bombers. Okay. And after you've escorted the bombers to their target on your way back home, if you see anything down there that uh, belongs to the enemy, you can go down and attack it. Okay, yeah. yeah. And our guys attack trains, cars, buses, boats. About two weeks ago, I was in, uh, I was in, in Italy. I, I go there as a representing the State Department in, uh, you know, speaking to, to groups. Yeah. And I went to the city of Trieste. I was anxious to get there because our guys was in the Trieste Harbor, the harbor of Trieste, where our guys sank a destroyer. Oh, they were yeah. coming back from a mission from, I think they had escorted bombers over to Hungary or something, and they were on the way back home. Okay. And uh, they were dropping that real low there, it's about rooftop high. And they get out to the bay and they see this ship out there, they, they're in the Adriatic Sea, and they see the ship out there, it wasn't ours, so they start shooting at it. Okay, yeah. It turns out that it was a torpedo ship. Wow. And the bullets of our guys' guns hit the torpedoes. Okay. <laughs> they exploded and sank the ship. Yeah, yeah. Now, no other fighter squadron uh, got credit for sinking a ship as big as a uh, big as a, a destroyer. Yeah. You know, they, our guys have shot off boats and, and horse wagons and all, trains and all kinds of stuff. But no other group got it, uh, credit for a ship as big as a... Uh, 
The things are crazy. It's amazing. That happened in Trieste Harbor, and I was just so glad to have been there. Be sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, that actually occurred. Mm -hmm. 1985, there was another. Uh, yeah, that was the, that was the uh, HBO movie, Tuskegee Gear. Okay. Lawrence Fishburne, Cuba Gooding, Theodore Brown. Oh, Cuba like, was in both movies. Yeah, he's in both of them. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh -huh. Well, that movie, interestingly, one of our guys, a guy named Robert Williams, Broke the story for that when Robert Williams was involved in in, in in movies, you know, commercials and things of that sort in, yes. in Hollywood. And he felt that the Tuskegee Airmen story should be on the screen. Sure, yeah. So he wrote the story. He wrote a story about the guys who made up his class from the time they left home to the time they got down to Tuskegee and through flight school and into combat. Okay. He finished writing the book in 1950. It took him 45 years. Wow to find a company to make a movie of that okay. story. Okay. And finally, HBO picked up the ball and made the movie that came out in 1995. Oh, wow. That's when we started getting, uh, that's when we got noticed, that's when we started getting publicity. Mm -hmm. And that movie, it took 45 years. And they made movies about, you know, black drug runners, black yeah. champs, black, uh, you know, drunkards and all that stuff. But, but black heroes... Unfortunately, we don't get enough of that type of story. story. No, we don't. They want to put, I don't want to say they, forgive me. Well, there's a box that they think that we belong in, a certain type of stereotype. Yes, yes, and they don't want us out of that box. And I understand Lucas had said, uh, we were one of the premiers with Lucas. Okay. Uh, Lucas and, and all, all the actors, uh, Terrence Howard, uh, Luke Bidden, they were all there. We were up in New York yeah. at the London Hotel. Yeah. And um, he had said that a lot of the uh, studios felt that uh, the movie wouldn't sell in Europe. I understand mm -hmm. a lot of the consideration for making a lot of big movies has to do with well, how well will this sales. sell? How well will this sell internationally? Right, right. And they for somehow didn't think a, a, an all-black cast of, of black heroes men would sell in, in Europe. So yeah. that's one of the reasons why they, you know, sort of inured in uh, bringing out the movie. Yeah. But Lucas saw it as an entirely, entirely different. I want to switch gears for a moment and go back to the youth. Um, again, we were speaking that, you know, the sacrifice and the years that you had to wait uh, to accomplish all that you accomplished. Mm -hmm. And today, kids have access, opportunity to so much. Does it pain you to see the youth of today and how they maybe take not advantage of the opportunities, spoil their it's opportunities? It's extremely painful because we thought we'd bang our heads against the wall trying to get young people to wake up and take advantage of all these opportunities. Mm -hmm. When our commander, Benjamin Davis Jr., was at West Point from 32 to 36, he was the only black cadet there. He was ostracized for those four years. Mm -hmm. Today, all the academies are open. All, all the military, the West Point, Navy, Coast Guard, all of them are open. And they're begging for minority youth to come in. Right. right. Tragically, so many of our kids can't uh, meet the entrance requirements. So they know about these programs well, we because some of it may, they mm -hmm. just don't know about the opportunity. Well, possibly. But then a lot of those who do know about it can't meet, meet the entrance qualifications. You have to have fairly good grades in school. Okay. You have to be free of arrest records and drug records. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a big hurdle for some of us, you know. You know, what's interesting nowadays is that, you know, back in your time, the 30s and 40s, 50s even, racism mm -hmm. was overt. You can see it, you can yeah. smell it, it's right there. But yeah. now, some people say it's kind of interwoven into the system. Yes, you don't, and uh, you don't see it. You don't mm -hmm. see it as much as you did back then. Right. So I wonder, do our kids of today, because it's now institutionalized, if mm -hmm. you will, have a harder time of breaking down those barriers? But see, I think, uh, first of all, we've got to be ready. You know, opportunity knocks once. Mm. And when, that, when that door opens, you've got to be ready to charge in. Okay. You can't say, oh, well, it's going to open. Well, now I'll start getting ready. No, you've got to be ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the opportunity comes, you got to be ready. you got to strike that iron when it's red hot. How do you get ready for the opportunity? Well, what you, education. Education yeah. is the elevator. My slogan is that education is the elevator. Okay. okay. And you've got to do as, as well as you possibly can in school. Oh, yeah. Uh, with our kids waste so much time on television and those things in their ear and and these things. Yeah, and, the iPods. Yeah, and they're, and neglecting, the they're neglecting the books. Oh, yeah. You know, one, one of the things that really struck me was that over in, uh, I think it was Korea, the police go around closing up tutoring tutoring uh, establishments hmm. because the kids are spending so much time in these schools tutoring that they're getting tutored that they're injuring their health. They wow. realize that 
you, in order you have to get into the top university yeah. in order to get the top education they get the top jobs yeah. so all these kids are working night and day studying and working night and day these tutoring is after school okay and these okay. tutoring establishments they'll learn as much as they possibly can wow amazing yeah that's because well over here don't even go to cut school, man. Don't even bother to go. Yeah. Let alone stay a full day in school and then spend half your night in school again. Sure. Our sure. kids just don't have the drive. It's not there, the drive where the And a lot of that comes yeah. from home. And the tragic thing is that we have babies having babies. Mm. And we got these people and these girls having babies and the men are doubly at fault. These girls having babies and they're not mature themselves. They probably were not very successful in school. Right, right. So now they have sort of a negative attitude towards school and toward teachers. Yeah. And they pass that on to their kids. Fixing all of this is a long process. A long, hard process. Any ideas yes, or is. thoughts on how to fix? Oh, boy. Well, I would love to see a lot of boarding schools with highly qualified personnel in those boarding schools, getting the kids away from the negative influences mm. in, in their in their communities. Okay, okay. Yeah. And that's what I, well, Girard College is one type of school. Sure. But I love to see a whole lot of Girard Colleges. Sure, remove them from the that negative element. Remove them from the negative mm. element, and then you have to have highly qualified people in those schools. Mm. You can't give darn near minimum wage people the job of teaching kids. Sure. Yeah. They don't have they don't have the qualifications or the education themselves. Correct. To do it. Correct. And that, that's my only way of seeing um, you know and then of course having as many facilities as possible in the churches and every place else. In the community. In the community, tutoring and then you have to try to get the parents. The parents of the kids. They're yeah. the ones why should a kid after spending four or five years at home with somebody get to school and doesn't know his colors? Mm. Yeah. That's criminal. Uh, kindergarten is not playing in the dirt box anymore. Right. right kindergarten right. is actual, actual schooling. Yeah, yeah. And the kid should have quite a bit on the ball uh, when, he, when he gets there. Sure, yeah. And um, I was talking to my wife last night. Oh, well, the other day we were talking about uh, wealth and, and poverty and so forth. I was saying to her that, uh, you know, a poor kid is behind the eight ball right from the start. Mm. As soon as he comes out of the womb, you, you take two kids, a, a kid from a very poor economic situation and another kid from a fairly, you know, moderate to well-to-do situation. When that kid is born, he hears conversation. Now, what is the quality of conversation in the poor home or in the middle class? What, what's the quality of that con? The kid can't even eat or walk. He can barely, but hears conversation. Yes, yes. What's the quality? Of, what's the vocabulary in that conversation? That's implanted in his That's brain. That's implanted in the kid. Yeah. And when this kid grows up, he hears it either enriched conversation, or he's in an enriched environment, or he's in one that is not so so enriched. Okay. So it takes a heck of a lot to bring this kid up to, to where this kid is. Sure, sure. If, if they ever reach the same level, because this kid is steadily going. Yeah, yeah. And you got to put a double double load behind this kid to get him up there. Wow. Okay. So we, we've got um, we've got a rough road, a rough road to hoe, but uh, yeah. we can't give up. We've got to you know keep keep going, yeah, keep, keep on keep, pushing. Yeah, keep on pushing. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for this segment of Pleasant Perspectives. It's been a very good conversation with our friend Dr. Richardson. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen. He has done some wonderful things for our country, even our community. And he, as you have learned and listened, will continue to do some of those things. Please jump on his website, uh, join the Tuskegee Airmen Philadelphia chapter. There's some wonderful things going on there. As you have heard, please support them because they are about building the community. They are about building a stronger people, which builds a stronger nation. So please continue to support them. I'm Michael W. Pleasant. It's been a good half an hour, good show, and we'll see you soon. Music, MC, My Supremacy Records, 09. Yeah, yeah, girl in the hood, I'm about to build it up. We're building the hood, yeah. I'm about to build it up. We're building the hood, uh -huh. I'm about to build it up. Yeah, yeah. We about to build it up, our music. Uh -huh. Come on, we about to build it up. Let me see. Yeah, we about to build it up, my supremacy.